Hello and welcome to the Hypno Travelers on the Magical Psyche Highway Podcast. That's right. Your host and tour guide is Scott Prevet, a healer, hypnotist, and a magician. And your bus driver, Jason Gobelli, also a hypnotist, an entrepreneur, and a spiritual guide. Disclaimer, neither Jason, Scott, or any of our guests here today are licensed professional psychologists or psychiatrists. So please don't make any changes to any medication or treatments that you are currently on based on the conversation that you hear here today. Just hop on the bus and enjoy the ride. Trip with us on the Inner Revelation bus. That's right. Hi, I'm Jason. Welcome back to the Hypno Travelers on the Magical Psyche Highway. We are excited today. We got Jess Marion with us. Now, Scott's not with us today. Scott's sick. He's not doing so well. So you're just going to have me and Jess here today, but it's going to be a great show because we got Jess. So Jess, how are you? Who are you and what do you do? Hi, Jason. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so I am, of course, a, a hypnotist. I'm also a trainer, author, uh, and a sacred medicine facilitator. So in my day-to-day -day life, I, I see coaching clients, hypnosis clients. I also write books. I teach hypnosis, NLP, as well as uh, shamanic healing practices. Uh, and then on the side, or in addition to, I also lead sacred medicine uh, groups and individual ceremonies. Nice. Nice. So let's talk about this for a second, Jess. You've got your hands in all kinds of things. So yes. what, what's your go-to? Um, My go-to? What do you mean? Well, you know, when someone comes in, what's your favorite modality to work with? Or are you blending things together? It really depends on the needs of the individual because I get a diverse client range and most of my business now is referral based. So if I get a client who comes in and says they want to quit smoking, of course, I'm going to go with the, the easy approach, hypnosis, one session done. If I have a client comes in who says, um, you know, look, I think I have an entity attached to me. All these other approaches haven't worked. Can you help? I'm likely going to take a more shamanic approach with them because they've tried everything else. Um, if I have a client who comes in to see me who is curious about um, the nature of reality, the nature of the soul, or if they are in the process of facing the end of this life, uh, then I'm going to be leaning more towards sacred medicine work if that's something that's congruent with them. Uh, that path is not for everyone. In fact, uh, there's a large percentage of the population that it's just not right for right now. But for those who it is right for, it is an incredibly healing and profoundly transformative experience. Uh, and in terms of my go-to beyond what I, doing what works, it really comes down to um, also for myself, what in that moment do I find the most interesting? Nice. So you were saying that sacred medicine, well, tell us, tell our viewers. What's that all about? So us in the West will probably know that uh, more familiarly, familiarly, oh, excuse me, more commonly <laughs> uh, as psychedelics. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So I work with uh, mushrooms primarily. Okay. Mushrooms. Gotcha. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So, and, and then what happens with this? So how does this work with healing? Uh, so... Psychedelics or sacred medicines are the most powerful psychoactive compounds on the face of the earth. Not only that, they have been a part of human history since the dawn of humanity. They have been in existence throughout cultures around the world since as long as we have written records. They've been the source of spiritual inspiration. They've been the source of certain theologies still in existence. They've been the foundation of cultures that are still around today. Uh, so they've been with us for a long time. They are our closest ally for healing. Um, that's kind of the, the big picture. If we kind of bring it down into something like, say, neuroscience, uh, what these medicines do is they do two things. The first is they cause a downregulation of the default mode network. The default mode network is tied to our beliefs, our identity. In the hypnosis world, you might know this as the critical faculty. Uh, but it down regulates it beyond what we can do as hypnotists, like way beyond. The next thing that it does is it causes the brain to uh, become out of sync with itself. 
what the combination of these two things do is it allows new novel neural connections to be made that were not possible prior to that experience. Uh, so now you have new neural networks connecting in novel ways that have the potential, depending on the framing of the experience, to help people uh, let go of addictions. Uh, it's a big area, PTSD, depression. It is pivotal in end-of-life care. Uh, in fact, my clients who are facing the end of life have found tremendous value from this work. Uh, and also for people who are fine, but want to explore spirituality, more, want to deepen their connection to source and to self, this is the most powerful technique that we have uh, to do that. Hypnosis is great. Hypnosis is like um, taking um, like a hammer and a chisel to a problem. Psychedelics are like taking an atomic bomb to it. So in some scenarios with some people, that's ideal, where with others, it's better to go the hypnosis route. And then there are things that can be accomplished with sacred medicines that cannot be replicated with hypnosis. Hypnosis can try to replicate it. Hypnosis can try to revivify it, but it just does not come anywhere close to what happens in the medicine space. So this comes down to what is going to be Again, in the client's best interest, because medicine work is not without its risks, what's going to be the most helpful and what's going to be the quickest path to their resolution and what they're looking for. Wow. So it's interesting. So is this what your book's written on? Uh, so I have right now, I think I have 11 or 12 books, and those books are mainly about coaching, different coaching modalities. My most recent book came out like a year and a half or two years ago. The Hypnotic Coach, this is about conversational change work. I haven't written a book yet on medicine work. Uh, that will probably be coming at some point in the future. Um, but I've kind of, for the last couple of years, because I've been focusing more on that step back from book writing. Now, it was interesting because earlier you said that you would use mushrooms mm -hmm. to help with addiction. Yes. And there's a large amount of people that would think that mushrooms can become an addiction. In because it, it's because they don't know anything about it and have never experienced it. Okay. Uh, people who believe that have been fed a lot of misinformation from the government all the way back to the 1960s. And you can even argue back to the 1920s with the prohibition of cannabis. Uh, mushrooms, any of the classic psychedelics. So mushrooms, LSD, DMT, which is the active ingredient also in ayahuasca, mescaline, which is the active ingredient in peyote, as well as Wachuma or San Pedro, they are biochemically non-addictive. Because for a chemical to be biochemically addictive, what it does is it causes a spike in dopamine. That's not what these substances do. These substances bind to the 5H2A serotonin receptors in our brain, and some of them also bind to the 5H1A serotonin receptors. So when they bind to the, the serotonin receptors, they block the serotonin from entering those those receptors and then being broken down. This creates a very different experience from something like, uh, you know, heroin or cocaine or meth that act on uh, dopamine receptors as well as uh, GABA and a few other uh, neuroreceptors in the brain. So these substances are biochemically non-addictive. These substances are also psychologically non-addictive. Uh, because if you've ever gone on a strong mushroom journey, you think, I don't ever need to do that again. I'm good. Or maybe I only do this once or twice a year. Uh, it's not a pleasure cruise. You are confronted with your shadow. You are confronted with the scary parts of the self, the scary parts of reality, whatever that is. And you're also exposed to the beauty of creation, the beauty of the divine and how the divine acts in this world. But you can't live in that space. Your body can't physically do it. You'll miss normal everyday reality. Um, so no, it's not addictive. In fact, the research on addiction, psilocybin, which is one of four main alkal alkaloids in mushrooms, so four of the main substances that cause one to trip, uh, have been shown to repair parts of the brain that are actually linked to alcohol addiction. So once that's repaired, the need for alcohol disappears. Uh, ibogaine or iboga, which is an African psychedelic, I don't work with it, uh, but there is a lot of research on it. And there are centers that specifically work with that has been shown to help people come off of hard drugs such as meth, heroin and fentanyl. 
uh, people will go on a journey as they're detoxing and they come out of this very lengthy journey. That journey is a long, long one. Uh, it's a couple of days in some instances, and they don't have the biochemical or the psycho-spiritual need to reach for those substances again. Now, Jess, when was it that you had that first aha moment where you're like, man, I'm going to be able to help people? Uh, you know, the the first aha moment in regards to medicine work was actually much later than uh, hypnosis. In terms of medicine work, it was probably after I had my first experience with it and saw how profound and uh, transformative and transcendental it was and how it was not what I thought or I had been told that experience would be. However, you saw your first aha moment was with hypnosis? Did you? Yeah, just... and that was probably like with hypnosis, I'd always from a young age had an interest in it because to me it looked like magic. And honestly, I didn't get into hypnosis because I had any interest in helping people. I got into it for purely selfish reasons. Uh, I was interested in it as a topic. I was interested in it as an experience and maybe something that could supplement my own search for mystical experiences. And then along the way, I was like, hmm, I'm pretty good at this. I bet you other people could benefit. So that aha moment came much later when I started working with clients, like back in 2010, that, that time frame. Interesting. So you've always had this uh, craving for the spiritual realm. Yes. And what's that all about? Well, I think uh, some people just have that natural inclination. Uh, people like me look at this material world and go, there's got to be more. Even if I tried on the staunchly atheist nihilist view that there's nothing, logically, from what I know of things of disciplines like quantum physics, that doesn't make sense. So if the complete negation of anything mystical doesn't make sense, then I'm left with, okay, there is something here, but what is it? And I went, you know, I, I've traveled in many different circles. Uh, I'm a, a pranavidya practitioner and trainer, which is uh, uh, Vedic energy healing, Hindu energy healing, Reiki practitioner. Um, I teach uh, yoga nidra. I've practiced tantric Buddhism. I practiced tantra in the Hindu context for a long time. I've worked with mantras. I've done ritual magic. I am initiated as a Paco, which is a priestess within the Andean tradition. So like I've made my rounds. Uh, and now my work is really a combination of what works given either for myself, what I need, or for a client, what do they need? What's going to be of most value for them? Well, Jess, you've dabbled in a little bit of everything. What don't you do? <laughs> See, I have a little bit of like topic ADD. Uh, in that I will get bored with something within like a year or two and I need to do something different. However, during the, those couple of years, I will dive deep. And whatever that topic is, that pretty much becomes like my whole life. Uh, because I want to live it out to its fullest potential for a substantial period of time to find what in it works for me, works and fits in my life and what benefits others. So I started meditating uh, when I was 12 years old. I started with Zen meditation, Zazen, and I still practice. Uh, I, I now do a different type of breath meditation. I do something called Anapana, which comes from the Vipassana tradition. I still work with mantra. I still maintain the things from the circles that I've moved through that I find of most value. So what's next? I'm not looking for what's next right now. Um, I've been I've been well seated. Uh, for quite a while now in the medicine work and in the Andean tradition of healing. So I'm not really out there looking for anything. Maybe it could be that book you were talking about earlier that you haven't written yet. You know, possibly, um, but I'm not in a rush to do. I'm more interested in being. Gotcha. So if I feel the inspiration, then I'll pursue something. If I don't, then I don't. So 11 books. Mm -hmm. Which one's your favorite? I think I'm torn. I'm torn between two. Um, probably Deep Trance Identification and The Hypnotic Coach. I like The Hypnotic Coach because it is really the most um, the most content for how I work with people and how I teach my students to work with people in one space without having to go through manual after manual after manual from NLP practitioner, NLP master practitioner, and advanced trainings that I've done. So I try to make it as concise and readable and useful as possible for, for anybody who is anywhere from 
just beginning their path as a conversational hypnotist up to maybe somebody who's been in the NLP world for a long time, but has been kind of stuck in one mode of doing that work. Then uh, deep trance identification or DTI would be my other favorite. And it's my other favorite uh, for a couple of reasons. The first, uh, I, I wrote it with a very close friend of mine, uh, Sean Carson, and as, as well as another very close friend of mine, a mentor of mine, John Overdurf. And there's no other book on the topic in existence. There are some academic papers written in Russian that we had translated during the, from the Soviet era about deep trance identification and how that was done. Um, and Steve Gilligan has some very minimal written materials on it from his training manuals, but nobody out there in the hypnosis world uh, had written a book on it. And nobody, as far as I have encountered in all of the training world, uh, has gone as deep into it and developing a full protocol as we had. And I, I'm very proud of that protocol to this day. I still I still work with clients using it. Nice. Well, let's talk about this for a second. Mm -hmm. What is deep chance identification all about anyway? Okay, so if you think about how small children learn, they learn through play, right? Right. Right. They, you know, pretend to be a doctor. They pretend to drive a car. They pre pretend to go grocery shopping. Or they pretend to be a superhero. Or they pretend to be a firefighter. Or they pretend to be a princess. They're practicing practical skills. Or they're practicing cultural values and cultural norms. Or they're practicing things like bra uh, courage, bravery, selflessness. And when children do this, they dive all the way into that role. For that time being, they are that figure or that archetype. As we grow though, we're trained not to play as adults, which is a shame, we should play more. And we lose the conscious ability to be as if. Deep trance identification gives us a roadmap to not only step into the shoes of a model, somebody who represents either a set of behaviors or skills or uh, um, emotions and values that we'd like to adapt into our lives, but it also allows us to do it fully. So we in the trance space can take on as many aspects of their personality and their lived experience as possible to enhance our own well-being, enhance our own skill sets, enhance or change beliefs, grow in values. Um, I've worked with a lot of people in the arts with DTI. Uh, I've worked with therapists using DTI. Uh, and it's really cool because it's a very um, precise process where we track improvements in performance in the external world. Because I need to know that it's working, otherwise I have to adjust. And you know, every time people see marked improvements in whatever skill they're looking to uh, gain access to or for their benefit. And I should say, like, this is not about, you know, I can't say I want to be Michael Jordan and all of a sudden go play basketball like an like a NBA guy. Uh, for one thing, I am only five foot three. So that's a problem. And I haven't spent time nurturing that skill set. So this isn't about stepping into a skill set out of nowhere. People who already have foundations are looking to get the leading edge to, to get the competitive advantage. And that's what DTI allows us to do. So nice. So all this is for your competitive advantage. So it's almost like performance enhancement. Yes. Performance enhancement, enhancement is one aspect of it. Uh, it can also be used not necessarily within the scope of competition, but if somebody wants to just learn something more easily or more fully, so it's not about competing with the outside world, but it's just becoming the best uh, I can be at a whatever skill set, then it's also a useful tool. Uh, I use variations of it uh, with therapy clients because uh, there's a lot of cool maneuvers you can do within DTI that will change their perspective on a problem and open up new possibilities, open up some more neural flexibility within the context of the problem. So it's highly adaptable. So these cool maneuvers, it's kind of like neural logistic programming, huh, NLP? Uh, it is. Uh, if, if you think like NLP tends to be top-down processing, meaning, okay, I am the coach. I have, let's say I'm going to do a swish with you. I kind of have these set steps of how to do a swish, and I'm expecting you to follow along those steps, and then hopefully we'll get to the result that we're hoping for. DTI is about bottom-up processing. DTI is, I'm going to say to you, okay, 
go out and watch as many YouTube videos of your chosen model as you can. Don't do anything with it. Just watch as many videos. Come in. We do all the preliminary work. There's a lot of preparation stuff we do. And then go into trance. And then I'm going to put you in trance in a context where I'm just going to have you associate into being that person in that novel context and experiencing it from their perspective. So now we're working from embodied experience. And then later, you move that information up to the conscious level and express it out in the world. Nice. Nice. So you got a lot of stuff going on. You've got this that you do, the the, the Reiki, the shamanic stuff, eh, all over the place. Yep. So who are the mentors that you've been following? Right. So I would say I'm not all over the place. Well, I mean, different. I've actually, um, diversity creates uh, or invites creativity. Um, so these diverse interests are all about for me, getting me more in touch with that centered space. Uh, and then, of course, expressing that in the outside world to help clients. Uh, in terms of my mentors, um, uh, well, my first mentor, and still my mentor and good friend, John Overdurf, who is um, argue with, arguably the best change worker on the face of the earth currently, uh, and likely the best trainer. I have not encountered anybody who can do what he does to the level that he does it. Uh, and then... Mentors kind of come and go in the shamanic space. Uh, my maestro, my teacher, one of my my teachers uh, is a gentleman in Peru uh, by the name of Puma Singone, uh, who's a Paco in my lineage. Uh, I've trained with other people in different uh, shamanic traditions, but not as closely. So I wouldn't necessarily say that they're mentors. Well, we just interviewed last week a woman that was very shamanic. And she was talking about connecting with all the angels and the ancestors and mm -hmm. things like this. So do you go on those lines or, or or differently? Because I know there's a lot of different indigenous people who have different shamanic experiences. Yeah. So, yeah, I don't I don't work with the angels so much. That's not really um within the scope of my practice. Um I do I do have a uh team of uh helping spirits. Some are tied to the land, some are in the, the upper world uh, who help me. We all have these guides, by the way. Uh, you do, everybody listening has a team of spirits supporting them. Uh, I do access them purposely uh, because they're needed when I'm facilitating the medicine space. They're also very important to removing uh, problematic entities, that sort of thing. Uh, the shamanism, as I practice it, is not ethereal. It's not, let's just go talk to the upper world all day. Uh, it's dirty. It's earth-based. Uh, it's heavy lifting. It deals a lot with the shadow. True, true shamanic work uh, is about how do you discover and dance with your shadow? You have to be able to pass through the shadow. You have to be able to pass through insanity, the dark night of the soul, and come out on the other side. It's tough. It's not easy work. It's not um let me go take a you know a 500 dollar course and get a certificate it's are you putting in the day-to-day -day work to strengthen your relationship with the spirits and also um work with your shadow well it sounds to me and i could be wrong but it sounds to me and being centered with the different modalities that there's a blend mm -hmm. all together and that whole combination and makes you unique as to who you are and what you do. Yes. And so if you could classify that blend, what, what would you call it? What's that like? Yeah, I wouldn't have a classification for it. Um, I would say it's just a question of the person that I'm with. Are they more attuned to neuroscience, which is my my foundation, my background. My, before I went into being, becoming a, a hypnotist, I was a medical anthropologist by training, did my undergrad in psychology, um, and also have a, a master's in religion. I was more academic. So is the person with me more academic, more material reality-based? Then I have access to that. If I have somebody, though, who is interested in these bigger questions, then I'm more at home uh, kind of talking about these bigger things. But it's, I, I wouldn't categorize it because humans also, uh, you know, we're spirit and we aren't, we don't fit into categories. Right. 
uh, even like our day-to-day -day personality shift. Who you are as a hypnotist is very different from who you are as a friend, who you are as a parent or a sibling or, you know, the boss at an office. Uh, all these different aspects of identity are fractals or facets of a jewel, if you prefer, uh, that make you one whole being that doesn't really fit category. Any category you try to put yourself in uh, is an illusion. It's an act of self-hypnosis. As soon as you say the two magic words, you've locked yourself, you've put yourself in chains. Those two words are I am. Whatever you say after that, you've now bound yourself. So be careful what you say after you say I am. Be careful what fractals you associate into or what facets of yourself or the universe you choose to express because I am can either put you in the chains or it can be the most powerful spell you weave in your life for your benefit. So choose wisely. Well, I don't think, good. No, it's, it's interesting because the very first question I asked you is, who are you? <laughs> yep. Yeah. So, and, you know, we do have like general, like normal human social expectations. I wouldn't recommend anytime somebody asks who you are answering in the way I just answered, um, because they're going to look at you like you got 10 heads. Like, it's OK to be like grounded in this material reality. It's fine. <laughs> but keep the awareness inside that as soon as you say I am. Whatever you say after, it's it's magic. So choose that magic carefully. Nice. So I noticed that a few times you've told me, and 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 I think it's important too that we adapt to whoever we're with. Mm -hmm. But what about when we're doing that self journey? Mm -hmm. Then how? Well, we, well, let's talk about that for a second. About that's you. when your truest self comes out. Yeah. So let's talk about your true self for a second. So, 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 so what's that feel like? And what's that about? So you're essentially asking for a verbal description of the ineffable, which is very difficult to give. Um, I would say that to try and describe it would to limit it. And I would watch this interview a year from now and say that's completely wrong. <laughs> uh, because you also live in a state of conscious change. Uh, but we do have parts of us uh, that I believe uh, learn, but they still carry everything. You don't become a, diff a totally different person every year, every seven years or whatever. Um, so I would not answer that because I don't want to be put into chains. But I would say that um, it is ineffable regardless of who you ask. Once somebody tastes that essence that is beyond memory, it's beyond language, it's beyond the like conscious everyday nonsense we all put up with on this planet. It's beyond political identities, it's beyond religious beliefs, it's beyond opposites. When you touch on that, you touch on immortality. And I'll just leave it at that. So I guess what we're saying is, is that I'm not who I was yesterday and I'm not gonna be who I am tomorrow. And to avoid what you were saying, I am who I am. Yep. <laughs> and I would say you're both not who you were yesterday or who you'll be tomorrow. And you also are who you were yesterday and who you're going to be tomorrow. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's, so that's kind of fun. We went down a rabbit's hole on that one, didn't we? We sure did. <laughs> so listen, if you could pretend, mm -hmm. let's play for a second. Sure. Let's pretend that we're looking in a, 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 a timeline and you see your future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any idea what that's going to look like in 10 years? Or no, how no idea. Have you had any idea of what you'd want it to look like? Yeah, I have ideas, but ideas of what I want it to look like. Again, this is conscious mind stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's fickle. That's subject to change. Mm -hmm. Um, so if I look 10 years in my future, I can say I, there's broad things I want, you know, connection, love, security. But if you're asking, like, I want like a luxury penthouse apartment in Manhattan. Um, yeah, that would be nice. But realistically, that's not going to happen. But hey, if the universe wants to give it to me, I'll take it. Uh, so stuff like that, like I don't find particularly useful to put out on my timeline. I think it's more important to focus on the present 
and what I can do in the present moment to ensure kind of these broad strokes of what I want throughout my life continue to replicate themselves across my timeline. Nice. So, okay, now here's another one. We went to the future. Let's just, mm -hmm. if you could look in your past, is there anything that you'd want to tell yourself that from your today, what you'd want to tell yourself from before? Mm -hmm. No, no spoilers. <laughs> Right. No, because if I if I did that, then that would change my life experience all the way out. It's, it becomes the butterfly effect. And there's no guarantee that's for the better. I understand. Okay. <laughs> there we go. So let me ask you another question. This one's a good one. Yeah. How are our viewers going to get a hold of you? Sure. So you can check me out at uh, theintelligenthypnotist.com or jess marioncom for my, my shamanic services and, and other services. Um, you can email me. Uh, you can email me at philahypnosis at gmail.com. It's from back in the day. Yeah. P-H-I-L-A hypnosis at gmail.com. Or you can friend me on Facebook. Wonderful. Wonderful. And who, who should be getting a hold of you? Um, not everybody. No. <laughs> uh, anybody who's curious about what I do. Anybody who is curious about medicine work, about the shamanic side, or wants to further their hypnosis training, or just wants to chat about mystical stuff. Nice. Nice. So here's another question for you. Mm -hmm. If what are your words of wisdom that you want to bestow on our viewers? Uh, I would say know that you are never alone in this existence, even when you think you are, you're not. And live authentically. Don't don't care about what society says. Don't care about what structures in your life say. Be who you are. And as long as you're not, you know, harming yourself or others, then you can trust that you're being authentic. Um, live from that space. Your audience, your people, your clients will automatically resonate with you and find you more easily if you live from a space of authenticity. Nice. Nice. Is there anything else you want to add? No, I think that's that's it. <laughs> it's been fun. It's been a pleasure. It's been wonderful traveling down your magical psyche highway. I've well, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This has been a lot of fun. Yeah, I've, I've definitely enjoyed it. It's been a lot of fun. It's been great to get to know you and get to share you with our audience. And that said, uh, it's, we've loved going down your magical psyche highway and viewers out there. We're glad that you were with us. We hope you've enjoyed the show. I certainly have. And if you like us, give us a thumbs up. If you think we're assholes, give us the thumbs down. We don't care. We're just glad you're here. We hope you share it with your friends, spread us around and follow us. And we hope to see you next time. Thanks for coming. Wow. What a trip. Thanks for taking that journey with us today. Please like us, share us, and enlighten us with your views of the topics we drove into today. We appreciate you and love reading your comments. Thanks again, and we hope to see you back on the bus next week. That's right.